Ah. Ah. Huh. Hi. I feel like it should be a law of the universe that if it's made for nerds, it's gonna have a lot of sequels. Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, most adult films. Calculus is no exception to this rule. There are usually three calculus classes taught at universities and sometimes even more. My previous video was about Calculus 1, sometimes called Differential Calculus. You can find that on my channel. This video will be about Calculus 2, sometimes called Integral Calculus. So, sit back, lie down, do, do whatever I'm doing, and enjoy the show. Chapter 1. Doing math for fun! Alright. If you ever see math nerds doing math for fun, it's probably going to involve um, integration or integrals of some kind. Even college math departments have integration Bs where students just do integrals competitively. So what are these things and why are math nerds so obsessed with them? If you've seen my last video about derivatives, this will be easy to understand because the integral is just the opposite of a derivative. If you take the derivative of a function, then take the integral of that function, you'll get back the original function you started with, more or less. Is there any way to think of the integral just by itself though? Let's put it this way. We can tell that lines are one-dimensional shapes, or that squares or circles are two-dimensional shapes, and cubes, solids, are three-dimensional. But is there such a thing as a zero-dimensional shape? Well, as it turns out, singular points in space are zero-dimensional. There's no movement that can happen inside them. Now, what were to happen if I stacked a whole bunch of zero-dimensional points on top of each other? And by a bunch, I mean like an infinite number of points. Well, we would get a line, a one-dimensional shape. So infinite zero-dimensional shapes stacked on top of each other make a one-dimensional shape. If we wanted to get, say, a 2D square, we could just stack an infinite number of 1D lines on top of each other. Now, people gave may, uh, what I want you to get out of this is that Infinities make more dimensions. Adding a dimension is kind of like adding a new type of infinity. In a one-dimensional line, space extends infinitely in both directions. In a 2D plane, space extends infinitely in four directions. There are two pairs of directions. In a 3D cube, there are six ways that you can go infinitely on forever. There's a third pair of directions. Each new dimension adds a pair of infinities. In fact, dimension in Latin literally means two ways. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, it is. It's crazy because I made that up. That's not true. Derivatives and integrals are kind of like moving a function through dimensions. If you take a function to be a 1D line, the derivative is going to be the instantaneous rate of change at a 0D point. And if you take the integral of that 1D line function, you're going to get the area under that curve. So that's a 2D area under the curve. Integrals will send us up a dimension, while derivatives send us down. This is a lot. Taking the integral of a function can be useful for a lot of things. For example, if you have data on the number of new COVID cases per day, and you have a function to approximate, if you take the integral of that function, you can find the total number of cases there have been. While the line itself represents the amount of cases on any one given day, the area under the curve represents the total number of cases up to that point. Although integrals are taught second in calculus, in history they were actually discovered first. The way we first knew about pi and the area of a circle was from Greek math that looked a lot like an integral. Now, Without getting too technical, I want to get into this swishy symbol that is used in integrals because it looks pretty cool. You might notice that it looks like an S because it does, and that S stands for sum, which makes sense if you think of that area under the curve as adding all of the previous values up to that. In my last video, I mentioned Isaac Newton, and if you look at a picture of the farm where Newton grew up, 
you'll see some very interesting design choices on the door. It's almost like that symbol was embedded in Newton's subconscious or something, and then he used it in the math that he later invented. That's a pretty wild coincidence, right? Right, it is a wild coincidence, because Newton didn't actually come up with that symbol. I'll explain. Chapter two, the authorship question. If you ever ask the question, who invented calculus? The shortest answer you're going to get is Isaac Newton. But that answer is basically wrong. The thing is, calculus is a really good idea. And if you have a really good idea, chances are you weren't the first person to think it. And even if you were, there are probably gonna be people before you that were on to something. Looking through history, we can find mathematics from ancient Greece all the way through India in the 1300s that we would consider as involving calculus. Newton really gets the credit because he was the first person to get his head around the whole thing and formalize the definitions uh, and use it as a tool for science. Also because he was British and they were taking over the world. But his version of calculus still looks different than the one that we use today. For example, instead of derivatives, Newton used the term fluxion, which honestly is better branding if you ask me. Find the fluxion of the function! But even in his own time, Newton wasn't alone. Gottfried Leibniz, who was born around the same time as Newton, one of his contemporaries, independently discovered calculus on his own. Newton first developed his theory of fluxions in 1665. Meanwhile, Leibniz made his first calculus-ish discoveries in 1673, almost 10 years later. So, Newton discovered calculus first, right? Well, the thing is, both of them sat on their work for a really long time before publishing. The first time either of them actually published anything was almost a decade after that, in 1684. And that was Leibniz. Is it Leibniz or Leibniz? Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz. Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz. Gottfried Leibniz. Fuck. I thought I heard Leibniz. Maybe that's the maybe it's the German one. Gottfried von Leibniz. Ah. Uh. So at the time when Leibniz published in 1684. There wasn't any other published work tying Newton and calculus together, but he, Newton assumed Leibniz must have copied him. The Royal Society in Britain said that Leibniz was a fraud and they wrote this whole letter saying so and Newton signed off on it and it was a whole thing and, and it was just really ugly. The Newton, Leibniz, Leibniz, Rivalry is something that every math nerd is going to encounter. It's like Coke and Pepsi, or your peace of mind and your in-laws. Over time, I've come to find that both of them are important. Um, Leibniz and Newton, not your peace of mind and in-laws. I see Newton as the scientist and Leibniz as the mathematician. The applied and pure sides of math, respectively. Having one without the other is like your cousin having a wedding without an all-you-can-eat buffet. Chapter three, the Goldilocks difficulty. So, why is it that math nerds do this stuff for fun? Well, it's because it's hard enough to make you feel smart and easy enough to make you feel smart. There are a lot of what are called integration techniques that are ways to break down an integral that seems really complicated at first and make it easy to solve. Sometimes a really hard integral will become super straightforward if you have the right technique in your toolbox. That being said, there are a lot of integrals that are so hard, they are provably impossible. Can't be done. When you first see an integral, you're not really sure where on this difficulty spectrum it is. If it's part of a class, you assume there's some kind of solution. But if you're just thinking one up to challenge yourself, anything goes. 
There's something exciting about attempting a problem that could be impossible, especially when it turns out to be easy. It's like one of those ads on the internet that says, uh, Only 200 IQ people or above can click the button! This is what I think the true appeal of the integral is. Not because of just its creativity or its applications, but because of the catharsis it provides. It's right at the core of what math is all about. The burning curiosity, the chase, right up to the moment that everything clicks! clicks.